Okay, hello and welcome to the fifth virtual seminar on applied economics and policy analysis in Central Asia. I'm your moderator, Bahar Mukasif, based in Tashkent. Uh, we're very privileged today to have speaker from Germany, Professor Martin Petrick. He's a longtime friend of Central Asia, visits Central Asia quite often, uh, supervises uh, graduate students from Central Asia. So he, <laughs> I'm sure most of the viewers know personally uh, Professor Petrick. So uh, briefly about Martin Petrick, he's a professor of agriculture, food, and environmental policy at uh, University of Gießen, Germany. He's also visiting research at the Leibniz Institute of Agriculture Development in Transition Economies, IAMO, in Halle. He holds a PhD in Ag Economics from Martin Luther University. Uh, he consulted many international organizations such as the DFG, European Commission, the World Bank, GIZ, and other institutions. He has many, many publications in leading uh, Ag and Applied Econ Journal, so I will not name any. You can see his full biography at his own website from, uh, on the university website. Uh, and thank you, Martin, again for uh, joining us today. So your time is much appreciated. Uh, to discuss and provide his comments, we're very privileged to have our discussant, uh, Dr. Peter Malvicini. Uh, Dr. Peter Malvicini is joining us from Westminster International University in Tashkent. He directs our newly launched center, uh, named Center for Policy Research and Outreach. Uh, Peter holds a PhD from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at Cornell University. So thanks very much, Peter, for joining us and for discussing uh, today's topic. So today's topic is an elusive quest, 25 years of search for the right farming model in post-Soviet Central Asia. I do not know the answer. I hope to find out. <laughs> Martin, over to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Bachrom, for the nice introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to speak to you in this uh, great seminar initiative. Uh, thanks once more to all the colleagues, especially Bachrom, uh, but also um, the uh, uh, colleagues from uh, IFPRI and IAMO who were instrumental in helping uh, setting this up, uh, Kami John and uh, Nodier especially. Um, yeah, uh, I thought this kind of exceptional circumstances this year uh, that um, made, uh, brought us together in this kind of exceptional seminar uh, also um, would be the right platform for raising a more fundamental question that is in my title, um, namely what's the right farming model in post-Soviet Central Asia? An elusive quest already hints at uh, the fact that uh, there have been many arguments and debates about this question and uh, well, I'm uh, not sure I'm going to give the final answer today. Uh, what you see in the back here is a, an individual farm in Kyrgyzstan that we visited uh, just two years ago, I think. And um, yeah, you may take that as a hint um, at in which direction in terms of what's the right farming model um, my presentation will be going. Um, yeah, uh, part of this kind of bigger question is that I would like to go back a bit in the recent literature on the topic. Um, one of the books that had a really formative impact on my own research in this subject area, which did not last for 25 years, but now for almost 20 years. Uh, if, look, I'm, if I'm looking back, uh, my first visit to a post-Soviet country was uh, in 1997, so um, <clears throat> where I did research on agriculture and structural change and restructuring. So this book by Don Van Atta, a longstanding eminence in the field of, of agrarian reform of post-Soviet Russia, um, I think brings to the forefront the, uh, the major, the, the issue, yeah, the issue that gave rise to that elusive quest in the very beginning, uh, in the early 90s, namely, he titled his book, The Farmer Threat, The Political Economy of Agrarian Reform in Post-Soviet Russia. And this title, I think, nicely summarizes uh, that uh, we are talking here not only about an economic question, not only a question of fundamental economic significance, but of course, and from the very beginning in all these countries uh, of a political dimension. And the farmer threat, well, who was threatened by the farmers? Who could be threatened by a farmer, you may wonder? Well, it was, uh, and it possibly still is, the ruling um, elite, the, those in charge of um, making their um, income or their uh, revenue and rents from the agricultural sector 
And um, yeah, these were the uh, Soviet apparatchiks and policymakers in the early years. Um, and now you may have some people and names in mind who take this role these days in the various Central Asian countries. So that's my starting point. Um, actually, my presentation will not, hopefully not be too uh, theoretical and even less ideological. Uh, I will just uh, bring up a few arguments, a, a few um, insights on what theory and what introspection maybe tells us about the uh, relevant um, uh, um, advantages uh, of certain types of family farms over other types. Uh, but then my presentation will largely be empirical and I hope to unfold it in the course of the presentation and hope you stay with me uh, in, in the argument when it, when it goes down the line. So, um, a, uh, what I would like to label the conventional view on the right farming model um, uh, has a, a straightforward connection to what other people call the family farm theory, which uh, I, where I listed a couple of, uh, of, of the major contributors to that theory starting in the 1950s in the US, basically first scholars uh, looking at that question, um, which says that there are no scale economies beyond the labor capacity of a family in agriculture and the growth of the labor force beyond the family size in, is inhibited by supervision costs, which both speaks in favor of, of smaller operational units that can still be managed by a family or even, even part of a family. So the, the family farm um, has been a long-standing model for agriculture policy making in most Western economies. Um, it is possibly no uh, accident and no, uh, not by chance that uh, in, in many of the influential countries um, in terms of development policy, uh, donors and so on and so forth, uh, family farms uh, were the backbone, uh, have been the backbone of agriculture for many decades, including in the US but also in Western Europe, of course. And for the, possibly for that reason also, it has been a blueprint for land reforms in developing countries over decades, um, at least to the extent that they were endorsed by the international agencies like the IMF, World Bank, etc. Well, and there has been research also, and here's where I'm already coming to the empirical part and the empirical questions that supported the idea that uh, uh, if you give uh, land to smaller farms, if you, uh, if you distribute it across smaller entities that will bring gains in land productivity. And that gave rise to the fairly famous so-called inverse productivity farm size relationship, which is an empirical relation. And here you see some of the classical uh, studies that uh, demonstrated that effect uh, from a textbook that appeared some two and a half decades ago, uh, summarizing that evidence uh, from, all, from all, almost all continents. Uh, you see here cases from Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America, not the former Soviet Union though, um, showing basically, I'm not going into the details here, yeah, um, a downward sloping uh, yield line when you plot it against the farm size, uh, which is done here in all these four panels. And um, uh, maybe noteworthy is it that uh, um, the, the farm sizes uh, from which this uh, downsize, this, this downward effect really takes hold is, we are talking here about farm size of three to five hectares or so, yeah, beyond that, we observe much lower yield levels. However, more recently, um, we have seen a, a quite lively debate actually in the last, may say five years or so, there have been a few key contributors really triggering that debate, um, which is questioning that established wisdom uh, and which argue, well, in fact, there is a positive relation in what we may call a modern economy, modern agriculture. Um, I took a different graph, yes, uh, taking a small step back to theory, uh, than the previous one. So you may wonder why now this is an, a positive relation here. This is because I, I'm turning here to uh, the uh, cost side of the uh, production efficiency. So this is the textbook uh, curves of uh, average cost curves, um, which are typically assumed to be U-shaped, plotted against farm size. Um, and um, Kei Otsuka, for example, um, the uh, former president of the International Association of Agriculture Economists and eminent agriculture economist in Japan. He, um, he entered this discussion, discussion a couple of years ago and argues that um, in larger farms under modern technologies with modern machinery and with modern wage levels, it is actually more cost efficient to have larger farm size, uh, whereas small, small farms, uh, which are labor intensive, will be 
uh, will be less uh, less productive, less less cost efficient. Yeah. And so the the answer that this diagram, this kind of insight, gives to the question of what's the right farming model would be opposite to the one that flows from this earlier literature. Right. Well, and now the the overarching question that I think many people asked in the beginning of the restructuring process after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and that has not lost its importance if you look at current policy debates in countries like Uzbekistan, for example, um, is, well, what is the right farming model for, for the post-Soviet countries, for Central Asia? How is Central Asia to be located, to be placed in this debate uh, and in this um, yeah, um, question of whether larger, more commercial farms or smaller ones should be um, the ones uh, to go for? And in the rest of my presentation, I would now like to delve a bit into some empirical work that I've been doing recently uh, based on a new data set in which also my uh, longstanding YAMO colleague, um, Nodia Johnny Bekap, has been involved. Hope he's uh, listening and watching today. Um, first, a few pictures from, uh, from field work in Central Asia showing what kind of people are we talking about when we talk about family farms. So the emerging new types of farms that were not welcome under the Soviet uh, agricultural strategy that emerged in the 90s slowly, more uh, faster in some countries. Uh, here we see such uh, operators from Tajikistan, um, from, from Uzbekistan, here the guy, a successful cotton farmer, or also in northern Kazakhstan here in the virgin lands. And in the back of this photo, you see the type of uh, K700 tractors that was inherited from the Soviet uh, time that you still find these days in, in fields in Central Asia and all across the Soviet Union uh, that points uh, at the fact that the, the family farms we are talking about in places like Kazakhstan are much bigger than three hectares. Yeah? Three hectares are almost required to put this uh, tractor on the ground. So the questions that will guide the rest of my presentation are the following. How did farm performance evolve in the five Central Asian countries over the past 25 years? Do we observe an inverse relation in Central Asia? Or does, and, or does the inverse relation differ by farm type? What does influence the inverse relation? And how did land reforms affect the inverse relation using that new database that I was mentioning before? Yeah, this is already a first summary of the database um, at the national level. The database I will show you is uh, detailed at the provincial level. Here I'm showing you the national uh, data. Um, the land use by farm type in the five countries covered in the study uh, break, broken down according to the three categories that are commonly um, used and observed all across uh, the post-Soviet countries, namely enterprises, typically corporate entities, often the successors of former collective farms, at least in the 90s, that was usually the case. Also, they also under, often underwent restructuring. Then the individual farms or family farms, yeah, which uh, were considered a threat to the uh, establishment by Don Van Atta. We see that in most countries, they really took hold in the meantime. And the households, also an important ingredient of the overall agricultural setup, small producers, uh, that um, had long-standing use rights or ownership rights in their, in their uh, household gardens and dacha plots uh, and which contribute a lot still today to the um, food output in these countries. Well, we see that uh, some countries were fairly fast in, in restructuring, abandoning their large-scale farms. Kyrgyzstan was the forerunner, where you see a large green chunk here. Um, others followed uh, later. Uh, Kazakhstan somewhat more hesitantly and keeps uh, a large fraction of enterprises uh, up to date in terms of land users. Tajikistan uh, with uh, um, a slow process up to the mid 2000s um, and Uzbekistan also had a, um, a fairly dynamic uh, reform process just recently after many years of delay in the early um, post uh, transition in the early transition phase. Turkmenistan is a special case, and I have to say the data for Turkmenistan is, of course, the most difficult and questionable, and even the categorization of farms is difficult. Uh, um, Svi Lerman has written uh, about this. Hopefully, he also managed to join us today. Um, we uh, assume that, by and large, Turkmenistan has been uh, unreforming, uh, has been unreformed, did not reform its, its uh, large-scale sector up to the end of this observation period, which is 2014. Um, and there is no real family, individual farms have emerging, there have been no family farms emerging in Turkmenistan as yet. Um, then we move on with a um, regression analysis of this provincial data. Um, 
um, for uh, which we develop these hypotheses that uh, we use to structure our analysis in the following. So our first hypothesis is uh, that the yield levels decrease with the farm size that we observe. So um, we take the yield levels as the product productivity indicator here. That's the, the best data we have on productivity um, hectare yields uh, and the farm size in terms of uh, um, hectares per, per farm. I, I tell you more about this uh, in a second. So the first hypothesis is that there is an inverse relationship in Central Asia as well. Our second hypothesis, land market reforms weaken the inverse relation. I will say more about that in a minute. Uh, so the idea that uh, uh, land market um, reforms, the, the, the possibility to um, exchange land will uh, benefit um, larger, uh, more commercial um, and uh, uh, mechanized individual farms that may actually follow the uh, idea that was depicted in that graph I showed you by Keio Tsuta in the beginning. So more following a Western kind of Western style um, uh, commercial farm type. Households display higher yield levels than individual farms. Um, that is a hypothesis that flows from the idea that households are especially uh, intensively using the labor force on their small plots and therefore display especially uh, exceptionally high yield levels. Uh, whereas we assume that corporate farms display lower yield levels than individual farms due to those uh, monitoring and labor supervision problems that I also mentioned in the beginning and that are um, a key uh, argument in the debate uh, about large-scale farming. Well, to analyze the effects of land reform, um, we defined um, a land, reform, land market reform indicator, uh, borrowing a phrase again from Svi Lerman, I think who dubbed them the turnaround years. However, we defined them slightly different than he did in some of his publications. Um, I mean, you can argue a lot about what is the uh, watershed, what is the turnaround here in each of these countries in terms of land reform. Um, I put some notes in this table here. I think what it reflects well is the uh, different degree of delay and hesitation that we found in the different countries in terms of serious land reforms. Kyrgyzstan, Forerunner, um, uh, Uzbekistan, a latecomer. Uh, well, Turkmenistan is, is problematic, the number anyway. Um, so we uh, yeah, kept it to 96, I think, which we took from some of the publications. Yeah, now about the data. So we work with province level data on yield and farm size for four output types, wheat, cotton, melon, and gross agricultural output for crops, all taken from official data sources, yeah, statistical offices. For up to 23 years, covering the period 92 to 2014. Uh, in total, we have data for 42 provinces in those five, in the five countries. And now the, Particularly interesting feature of the data for us is that the data is available by farm type for the three farm types that I was mentioning. Yeah? Enterprises, individual farms, and households. There has been a, uh, a tradition, uh, I think, from the Soviet statistical uh, offices that was kept to uh, provide data by farm type, which is for us as researchers of structural change very, very interesting and, and useful. Um, this uh, data was collected in the framework of a um, project uh, called AgrivaNet, which you will still find on the uh, YAMO website. The project has been uh, finalized a couple of years ago, but the database is still in, in process. Uh, we actually plan to make it available to the public very soon. Uh, the project was supported by the German Federal Minis Ministry of uh, Education and Research. So uh, what I'm going to present you now in terms of findings um, comes from two methodological approaches. The first is a non-parametric one, non-parametric regression approach, also known as smoothing, um, where you basically find the best fitting line in a cloud of, of data dots that I will be showing you in a second. Um, you will understand that easily. And the second is a more conventional linear regression model of this type of the equation shown here. So what we want to do in the regression model is to explain the yield levels as the dependent variable by a set of uh, regressors uh, in which we are particularly interested in the farm size, which we take in logarithms here. Um, the choice of other regressors is kind of limited by the data we have. I think what gives our data, what gives our estimates credibility is that, that we include uh, year and provincial uh, fixed effects. 
So everything that is kept constant in a certain province, which may include, for example, things like the natural conditions, um, soil conditions, but also distance to markets, uh, um, possibly even um, the, the basic uh, uh, infrastructure set up in terms of irrigation, maybe even capital uh, um, uh, availability. So th there I'm, I'm relatively optimistic we can capture a whole lot of factors uh, and also annual shocks are, are separated out from the regression yeah, by, the, by, the year, by the year fixed effects. In addition, we also include uh, climate data, which we have available on a provincial level for each of the years. So we can even um, uh, take into account changes in, in rainfall and temperature over the years. Um, from this model here, uh, we can test our first hypothesis easily, namely uh, whether there is an inverse relation in Central Asia. It prevails if beta, the parameter for the farm size here is negative. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, we work with some interaction uh, terms, um, which allow us uh, more, more differentiated analysis of the inverse relation by farm type. I'll show you that, and or you see it in the results sections. First of all, let's have a look in the distribution of farm sizes. So what is our farm size indicator? I think it's important to understand that in order to make sense of the rest of the findings. I, I told you that we use provincial level data over this time span, which by farm type, which means we have for each province and year, one average, you may call it representative farm that we construct from the data. Namely, um, one enterprise, one individual farm and one household. And for each of these, representative farm types at the provincial level for each of these 40 something provinces, um, we observe a yield indicator too, a, an, an output uh, measure yeah, for the different crops that I was mentioning, because they are also reported by farm type yeah, by the statistical offices. Which means I'm not talking about real, really existing individual uh, um, operators, farms yeah, that go into our regression, but rather what you may call provincial average farms. Yeah? aggregating, summarizing the information that is there at the provincial level. Now that's the lowest level of disaggregation we can go at using this data. Uh, I plotted these, uh, the distributions of the farm size um, for these three farm types uh, in this diagram here for the three years, uh, for, for three out of our 14 years, 96 um, um, and um, uh, or 23 years we have in total in our data. So I picked three years um, uh, with eight years difference between each of them to track the major changes in the distribution of farms. Yeah? Um, you see the enterprises here in the top chart, top part of the chart. Um, the dotted line is the earliest observation. That's this one here. Then 2004 four is the, uh, the red dashed line and the green solid line is the 2012 um, distribution. And you see a fairly stark development here, right? A fairly stark change over time. Um, while in the beginning of our observations in the mid nineties, there was a clear peak of, uh, of enterprise across all these countries with more than 1000 uh, hectares in, in, uh, in size. Yeah? And that was considerably smoothed out, flattened out here over the years and shifted to the left actually, which means um, the, uh, the, uh, the, mean the mean farm size shrank got much lower over the, over the years for agriculture enterprises. Here in 2012, it was around 100 something. Um, whereas at the same time, the variation increased also. Yeah? So we have now a much broader distribution, a much broader variation of types of enterprises in these different countries. Which is, which is broadly consistent, I think, with the idea that the decollectivization process meant a gradual move away from the traditional classical uh, collective farm model, yeah, also in terms of farm size. In individual farms, we have the uh, opposite development. So um, here's the dotted line, the dashed line, and the solid line, which is moving to the right here in terms of its peak. Yeah? So in individual farms, we see a rise in farm size from somehow 10, 10 hectares to up to 60, 70, 80 or so, yeah, which is now here. Still in our data set, I mean, all kinds of sizes up from one hectare are represented still among the individual farms also. And the least change has been happening with the households, not too surprisingly. Um, yeah, there has been relatively little change uh, in, in terms of how, how, how much land do the households cult cultivate. Uh, in general, it's, it's oscillating around uh, 0.1 hectares yeah, 
um, for their households. So there have been a fairly stable element in this structural change. Yeah, uh, now this, um, Martin, this is the, yeah. Um, if I may, there's a question. Um, sure. So I would like to remind viewers, if you have questions during the presentation, please use the chat box and at the end you can use the Q&A uh, function of, the, of Zoom. So the question is, how comparable are the Central Asian countries in terms of land use? Uh, for example, in Uzbekistan, there are private individual farmers, but land does not belong to them, while Kazakhstan farmers are the landowners. So if you can, that's a question from Dilfuza. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think there is quite some variation in types of uh, land uses across the five countries, but this, uh, later, this last statement is actually factually not correct because in Kazakhstan, the farmers are also not the land owners. <laughs> so uh, while Kazakhstan has introduced land ownership in the land reform of 2003-05, uh, it didn't have much of an effect in terms of widespread land ownership. So still today, land ownership uh, is with the state in Kazakhstan too. Yeah, it's, I think it's a uh, one point something percent of land, uh, agricultural land that is privately owned in the sense that we know from the West. So that's probably not the big difference, but uh, I mean, there are clear differences in, in natural conditions, of course. Yeah? I mean, uh, and especially Northern Kazakhstan, I think stands out here as the only major rain fed area in, in Central Asia, whereas most other regions are irrigated. Um, well, sure, which need to be taken into account when you interpret the data. Uh, on the other hand, as I mentioned in our analysis, we take that, uh, consider that by um, looking at changes over time only and keeping the fixed effects that also yeah, uh, reflect that kind of, of characteristic um, into our models. Shall I continue with my presentation, yeah? Bachum, is that fine, yeah? Yes, yes. yes. So here you see, the, um, here you see the, uh, the clouds of data, which is really giving you the whole wealth in the sense of the data that we have. Yeah? You see all the individual observations in our data represented here as colored dots for the four types of crops that we have been using. Yeah? Wheat, cotton, melon, and, and our fourth uh, output indicator is gross agriculture output uh, for crops. And um, yeah, it, I, you, you see that the, these, these, these clouds have a distinct uh, shape. Um, they come in clusters, uh, not too surprisingly, yeah? and, and especially in wheat, but also in melons, partly also in cotton, you can already, um, you can spot the different farm types. Yeah? You can, you can uh, imagine that uh, this may be the big guys, these are the farms and these are the households. Yeah? And um, now what we did is we did this uh, smoothing exercise. Yeah, so we we try to find the best uh, fit in this uh, fairly heterogeneous data cloud, uh, along with a confidence interval, which is so shown here as a as a dashed line, right and left of our 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 smoothing uh, our smoothing line, and um, uh, that shows pretty clearly that we have a kind of a. Uh, uh, a um, yeah, one one could call it a a, a stair step. Uh, a step, um, stepwise uh, um, a pattern here in the data um, linking the uh, output per hectare to the, to the farm size. And, the, and, and you see there is no clear, there is no clear linear relation here, yeah? at least not in wheat and possibly also not in melon. In cotton, uh, the situation looks a bit different. Yeah, here the, the picture is much more, uh, much more linear in fact. Um, uh, by the way, coming back to the previous question, there will be not many cotton farms from Kazakhstan in this cloud here, obviously, right? Because uh, especially in some of the regions, in the rain fed regions, no cotton is grown. Um, yeah, with GAO, um, we also see this slightly downward sloping uh, 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 line here, um, yeah, which together with these st steps here, st staircase steps here, um, uh, you may, you may guess that there is some inverse relation, but the story is actually more complicated. Yeah. And I think I can shed some light on that story, so on the relation between these two indicators by moving to the regression analysis, which allows us to uh, separate um, these, these clouds, um, these, these clusters within the clouds into distinct parts by introducing interaction terms into our regression model. Um, and uh, this graph here tries to show that uh, um, these different effects um, 
what we did here, we used the linear regression model that I showed you in the beginning, but we interacted the slope with the uh, farm type, yeah, which you see here. So we have the three farm types and we allow for different slopes for each of the three farm types. Yeah, and they are represented in the graph here, along again with confidence intervals. And uh, I think that gives a fairly interesting and actually the, so far the main finding of our analysis here, uh, it fully supports the idea of, of, um, of steps of a stair, yeah, that you may walk upwards here from right to left. Um, and which I think leads to a fairly startling finding in the end. Overall, the evidence is there that, that larger farms are less productive than smaller farms and that the households, I mean, we, we know that for decades, yeah, that the households are kind of hyper productive land users. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's uh, confirmed in each of those uh, uh, charts here. However, if you look at the other two types and coming back to that idea of the farmer threat also that I was uh, mentioning in the beginning, um, we, we do see that the individual farms are outbeating the enterprises in, in all of the physical crop measures here, yeah? in all of these crops that we included. So that this is a, a strong, I think, strong empirical support to the finding that individual farms continue to be the more land productive farms in Central Asia. And moreover, if you think of the arguments uh, about uh, what makes a modern commercial farming sector that uses uh, um, mechanization and modern technology that may lead to a positive relation, you see that confirmed within each of those farm types. Yeah? Within the individual farms, we have a positive relation. Within the enterprises, we do have a positive relation as well. Yeah? Which I think also makes sense um, and, and is, is consistent with our observation that of course by and large in Central Asia we have mechanized farms we have we have farms that can make use of um, a large fairly large-scale machinery partly I saw I showed you one of those pictures of the tractors even if we talk about Soviet technology yeah uh, which which can uh, provide for cost digressions from from using large-scale machinery gross agriculture output is a bit of a different story not so easy to interpret here we have a uh, an, in, an inverse relation all along the way and enterprises have an even slightly higher uh, uh, productivity level here. However, the problem with this indicator is that um, you cannot control for the uh, crop portfolio. Yeah? So it's quite likely that the enterprises are cultivating very different things than the households. Yeah? Uh, so that you cannot really compare the three lines very well here. All right, um, yeah, that's almost Martin, it. there's a question. Um, okay. on your on this last slide? slide, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. So why did you choose wheat, melon, and cotton? Uh, the question is cotton and wheat, for example, are not usually grown by households. Yeah. Well, obviously, um, our choice was limited to what the statistical offices would uh, provide to us. And moreover, we wanted to use crops that were um, cultivated all across Central Asia, yeah, because our interest was in, in doing that cross-country analysis also. And these three crops that we have here are fairly common in all of the countries. I mentioned up to some degree at least, yeah, cotton is only uh, cultivated in some, uh, in some areas of, of Central Asia, but where it's grown, it's a very important crop. And um, yes, with regard to the households, I agree, um, at least cotton is a kind of uh, strange animal there. And you see also here that the there are fairly few observations. Yeah, there is not much uh, sense in this data, I, I'd say. Although, I mean, the statistical offices, offices do report that there is crop, that there is cotton production in some households, and it may be worth a further study yeah, under which conditions that cotton is grown in households. Um, I think wheat and melon are quite common among households also, and uh, melon definitely is a crop that uh, that is. Uh, interestingly grown by all the different farm types here. I would assume that is actually more grown by households than by enterprises, but there is also information about melon cultivation in enterprises. And we know from places like uh, Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Magdaral region, for example, farmers have been moving even to melon as an alternative to cotton, yeah, as a commercial crop for them. So that's, that's uh, basically the reasoning behind the choice. Yeah? Okay, and one more question here. What happens if you include the square term of farm size? Does it give the optimal level of farm size? Yeah, yeah, we didn't uh, use uh, a, um, 
a square term might be interesting to look at as well. But as you note here, right, we, we run a, um, a semi-log model, yeah? So the farm size enters the regression uh, in log terms. Um, so I have a log scale here. So I can show uh, the, linear, uh, the linear line here, it, or, or the model produces a linear a relationship given that this is a log scale, yeah? Um, we thought that this may um, yeah, capture the relevant non-linearities in the model. Um, and I think the uh, confidence interval also give us <laughs> actually some confidence that, uh, that the relationship is fairly robust. But I agree, we could experiment with more complicated structures too, we didn't do so far. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, before I come to the conclusions, um, this is uh, the finding from, the, uh, uh, from another experiment or exercise where we interacted our, uh, our yield regression um, or where, where we included a, an interaction term for this land reform indicator that I showed you before, yeah? Whether our observations are before or after that turnaround year that I was explaining to you, where we want to, un to understand what are the effects of, this, of these land reforms. Now, the problem with the land reforms in Central Asia is that most of them were really gradual and not very far reaching, um, uh, so that the effects are possibly also gradual. And that is in, in fact the case. So this is the, um, yeah, what I see still most as work in progress. Uh, um, so the argument might be that I mentioned, I think also before, yeah, if we have uh, um, a thriving commercializing agriculture sector, and if land markets allow that, um, land is actually moving to the more productive uh, farmer, yeah, then we should observe that after the land reforms, the, uh, the figure looks more, the, the, the line looks more like the one that was described by Keo Tsuka, namely a positive relation. Yeah? So we would, would possibly observe a shift from a negative to a positive uh, uh, relation between these two indicators here. Um, we do not really observe that in the data. Uh, so far, you also see that uh, the confidence intervals here are partly fairly wide and overlap for the most part, which means by and large, at least given this specification, there is no great land reform effect in any of these countries or in any of these crops, better to say, um, given our five country sample. And um, uh, yeah, these are, another problem with this analysis is that we cannot or we did not so far differentiate with the, by the farm type so that we have to assume a, uh, um, fully log linear trend here all, along, all across the board, which as we saw before is not really doing justice to the data. Yeah. So maybe this is more like, a, uh, like an appetizer for further research that we need to do on the land reforms uh, with a preliminary conclusion that probably land reforms did not play that great role in, uh, in affecting uh, this, uh, uh, this, these changes that we observe in the productivity indicators. All right, so let's come to the conclusions and the implications. So we found that within the groups of individual and corporate farms, um, the uh, yield levels did increase with farm size, so that within these groups, the inverse re uh, relation is rejected and we see a positive relation between farm size and, and land productivity. However, uh, between farm types and within the households themselves, uh, our findings are consistent with the conventional arguments that larger farmers have a hard time in keeping their productivity levels um, so that um, I think it's especially uh, a clear uh, also in our data when you compare the enterprises with the individual farms. So that basically gives support to the long-standing argument that you cannot well organize such or you have to uh, buy um, uh, productivity losses when you uh, um, yeah, establish or maintain large farms that depend a lot on hired labor. Um, we do see a convergence towards uh, productive medium-sized farms, uh, partly due to gradual land market liberalization, but that effect is not very strong, yeah, which I showed on the previous slide, um, where also cotton is more, and we saw that cotton is a more static uh, crop than wheat and melon, possibly cotton is just uh, cropped by more homogeneous farms than the other crops. Yeah? We see less variation in cotton. Cotton is focused on a certain type of farms in each of the countries. Yeah? Um, and I mentioned also the, um, the problem in the interpretation of uh, gross agriculture output. Well, what does that mean? Um, coming back to our initial question, what kind of animal are the farms in Central Asia, given the global debate yeah, about the inverse relation on the one hand and modernizing farms on the other hand? 
Um, by and large, uh, commercial farms, so the individual farms, the enterprises, they exhibit features of modern uh, agriculture, what you call, may call modern agriculture, namely caused by capital intensive technology. Um, which means there is actually little scope for productivity improving land redistribution, which is the key policy implication um, uh, derived to be derived from, from an inverse relation. Yeah? If, if you observe that it would be much more productive um, to have land in small farms, then you may want to distribute land to smaller farmers and uh, have a double dividend by also raising the productivity, not only distributing land more more uh, equitably across the population, but also raising the productivity. There is no such evidence in Central Asia that this uh, would, uh, that would support such a policy implication at this point in the data that we have. Um, we can even conclude, I think, that uh, now, 25 years after the start of the reforms, the introduction of individual, sometimes family, not, sometimes not so family-based farms, was broadly successful, at, at least if we take the uh, land productivity as the success indicator. Um, our evidence is consistent with lower productivity of hired workers on corporate farms, as I mentioned. Um, and we may expect that gradually intensifying reform progress may help to further lift the productivity of smaller commercial farms. And in this sense, by and large, make Central Asia more akin to the rest of the world, especially the Western world, um, say Europe, North America, where also large individual farms, I think, are the uh, leading players in the field. Yeah, with that, I conclude. I in, uh, included a list of references in my slide set, which will be made available in one way or the other. I understand you are welcome to study some of this more thoroughly. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Your slides, I'm sure, uh, will be uploaded to the website. Uh, so I will provide the virtual floor to our discussant, uh, Peter Malvicini. In the meantime, uh, our viewers can send their questions through Q&A, then I will read those to our uh, speakers. So Peter, over to you. Uh, mute yourself. Yeah. Am I good? Am I yeah. on? Uh -huh. Sorry. Thank you. It's an honor to be a discussant for today's presentation. Uh, today is my wedding anniversary. I blame any lapse on my wife of 31 years uh, who distracts me even now. Um, I also share a 25 year elusive quest with, uh, um, with uh, Professor Petrick. Mine is focusing on searching for agricultural extension models that work with smallholder household farms. Obviously there are dimensions of this presentation that resonate with me. Uh, particularly. Um, coincidentally, if you recall slide two, Don Van Atta was my team leader in my recent work in Tajikistan, considering uh, uh, household farms and their productivity and ways of addressing that and measuring uh, different aspects. Um, just as a footnote, many of my reflections will be comparing a different study. Uh, Martin's uh, was a vast study across every uh, province uh, in five countries of Central Asia. My study looked at a single province in Tajikistan, um, Hatlan province, which is quite a large uh, farming oriented province. Just so you understand the scope, we worked with 170 women's groups across 150 mahala, reaching a total of 5,000 women. So it was a bit ambitious and funded as both a research and extension project together. Um, I think this notion and um, conclusion of smaller farm, the smaller the farm, the greater productivity has been long tested and to some degree contested, but mostly uh, affirmed by many studies uh, over the years. Um, so the, the research question that resonated with me was about farm types uh, that interest me the, the most in uh, productivity. And I think this research question 
is to some degree timeless. Um, it needs to be continually asked and continually asked in the, at the larger level and in the particular at the, um, at the uh, farm, household, uh, village uh, levels um, as well. And that's where I'm, um, I'm uh, particularly interested. Going through the slides, I, I think as was mentioned in the conclusions that the households display higher yield uh, levels than individual farms and also the uh, household farms then um, by extension uh, have greater uh, yields than the commercial uh, enterprise farms. So I think we're solid uh, there. Uh, when it, I believe it's already um, mentioned about the, um, the, the levels of productivity. If we were to go back to the slide about the percentage of uh, farm types across the five countries, I think that's a little bit interesting. Martin, I don't know if you can, yeah. Um, Take a note for of Tajikistan. It tells a different story. Um, I'm not one to trust the state statistical service of Tajikistan very much. So I'm, I believe that in 2015, during my work there, there are actually far more um, household farms than this um, even uh, pictures. And from um, World Bank data at the time, or a few years earlier, we understood that these household farms were responsible for over 50% of the domestic food consumed in Tajikistan. This is, has enormous food security implications um, as well. Again, beyond scope of the study, but I think uh, quite interesting uh, my, myself. Um, I, I think the question was already uh, put forth. Cotton is somewhat irrelevant when it comes to household farms, especially in um, Tajikistan, where we worked in Khatlan. Uh, I went to a meeting of about 500 farmers and the uh, vice governor um, for uh, farming in the province stood up and said, cotton is dead, why are we wasting time on cotton? Especially you small farms and households um, need to give this up and work on things that are more productive. You, it's not merely a, um, a statement of my observation, it was something that was somewhat dangerous to say, given the uh, central um, political uh, view of the uh, National Agricultural Service there. This was very, um, not in line with the messages they wanted to hear to keep cotton going, uh, per se. I also would say that, at least in Tajikistan, I believe the farm, uh, the household farm sizes are even smaller than that which is shown on the, uh, on the graph uh, presented earlier. Again, from our direct observation during the project and touring farms, we do have some data on this. Yes, you can see that under households. I would, um, I, I would slide uh, for Tajikistan that to the left quite a bit. And um, this again, uh, perhaps to do with my, my last point coming uh, forth. Um, Again, I, as suspected, the GAO, GAO crops yields clearly display stronger yields on smaller farmers. Um, I attribute this to somewhat to the flexibility and choices that smaller farmers can make. As you said, uh, Martin, there's a lot of variability in terms of what different household farmers would choose to plant. And I think it's that flexibility that has something to do also with the productivity, if that makes sense. Again, um, just going from our, our work within Hotland Province. Um, your implications seem to leave out household farms entirely. Um, apologies for that. Um, I, again, this is my, my, um, my preferential option is to be a champion for household farms and hoping that the, uh, the data uh, supports that evidence over time. Um, uh, that's just my observation there. One more thing, a couple more quick more things to mention. As you probably realize, uh, agricultural policy in Uzbekistan and practice are, uh, well, policy is changing quite quickly, practice not so much. Uh, obviously a bit slow to catch up 
with the, um, the policies that would, um, the government might desire. Um, you know, this shift to evidence-based policy making is good, but again, uh, if the evidence is um, statistics that might be questionable in their accuracy, you know, the, uh, the evidence for changes is perhaps weaker. Um, final, uh, final important question, which is well beyond uh, the scope of your study, is we observe that household farms are more productive often than the uh, family and uh, larger enterprise farms. Just because this is the case does not imply that household farms are not poor. Many household farms are very poor. So again, uh, studies in parallel, I think, need to ask, uh, what are the implications for this for um, agricultural policy and practice in any given country? I think um, living in Uzbekistan for a couple of years and testing this out with people working in the sector, um, the, um, the um, understanding I get is when it comes to poor um, uh, farmers experiencing quite a bit of, uh, you know, working with small uh, holdings, the situation across the border with the same farms isn't very different between um, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. It's kind of an artificial line um, in the way those farms behave. So I appreciate you hearing uh, my comments. And if, I don't know, there's much to contest, but um, uh, you're welcome very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter, uh, for, uh, uh, for raised uh, discussion points. So Martin, there are a couple of questions that go along well with, uh, with Peter's uh, comments. Let me read those because we're running out of time. Uh, perhaps you can respond wholly and then we have time. I'll read more questions. So the question is, uh, why little scope for productivity enhancing land redistribution? The results seem to suggest that redistribution from enterprises to family farmers in Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan could be very positive for productivity. Along with that, in your opinion, what would be an optimum farm size for small farms in Central Asia? Given the redistribution of land is now welcome, how can small farms access more land? So back to you, Martin. Oh, thanks very much, yeah. uh, Peter, especially for your detailed comments. And I think that's a nice compliment, uh, uh, co uh, nice uh, um, co-evidence to what I was uh, mentioning. Uh, because you kind of underlined the, the more uh, partly more colorful details also for coming from field studies that you have been doing in some of the places uh, which is of course very welcome and your focus on households uh, I would like to say is very well taken uh, in fact uh, I think uh, given their importance for not only rural livelihoods but also food production um, uh, Households are vastly understudied in Central Asia and in many, many other places as well. So I definitely encourage uh, you and anybody else to, to uh, um, continue to look at them. Um, it's just that um, the households were not at the uh, forefront of, of, of this study here because the, our interest was to understand, okay, given those, given the farmer threat, right? Uh, what, what, is, uh, uh, what is our, in hindsight, uh, finding on the farmer threat? Was there any credible threat? Um, and the alternative to... Uh, um, dissolving the collectives was certainly not to uh, uh, continue with only household producers all across the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, so uh, nobody would possibly reasonably uh, assume that uh, in the future um, uh, wheat or oil seeds or maybe even cotton would only be produced in households. But I, I fully subscribe to the points that you're making about the social and economic importance of households. Um, and. Um, yeah, that brings me to the first uh, question that you raised, uh, Bachum, from the auditorium. Um, well, um, my uh, conclusion about the uh, redistributive land reforms is based on this finding here, yeah, that I said, okay, there is no point giving land from larger producers uh, to smaller producers if we, if we observe that there is a, a fair middle ground of producers here that is in the individual farms that is also the most productive, at least as we look at these three physical indicators here. Um, well, you may argue, okay, there is still scope for taking land away from these guys here, right? From these and these. Um, 
yes, uh, maybe, indeed, yeah, I agree, but that would not be so much a redistribution to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to producers of one, two, three, four, five hectares, but rather making sure that the commercial operators at the forefront, like these guys, like these guys here, that they get access to the productive resources, including from the enterprise. And yes, I think there is indeed quite some policy uh, scope, uh, which may not necessarily mean a, a traditional uh, redistributed land reform, but the activation of land markets, that's what we need in, in Central Asia. And that is uh, still, um, I think, very uh, in very dire straits in many, in many of these places, yeah, where it's very hard uh, to get hold on land if you have a well-running individual farm. Uh, that's what we know from many interviews and studies. Um, and uh, well, the optimal farm size, yes, uh, that is uh, also a long-standing question. Um, I mean, my immediate answer from this uh, is that, uh, well, there is evidence that it is that larger individual farms yeah, that, that have the optimal farm size in terms of this productivity indicator, at least here, and as I'm indeed convinced that uh, larger individual farms also have other benefits, uh, economic and also for their communities. Um, yeah, I, I, I under, under, underwrite the idea that um, it's, a, it's a good idea to um, uh, take, take those larger commercial individual farms as a target for policy reforms. So one more question, technical question. So in terms of predictions, which model out of two makes more accurate predictions based on in-sample and out-of-sample predictions? Say again, which model provides the more accurate predictions? Yeah, based on in-sample and out-sample predictions. Okay, I think we, I don't show, I didn't show any out-sample predictions here. Uh, this is all based on the uh, linear regression model, the, the, basically the only model that we run here. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of uh, quality of the predictions, I think the only thing I can uh, point at here at the moment is the uh, confidence intervals that you see, which are fairly narrow for the larger farms. I would have to look up the R squares and so on so and so forth, which I don't have at hand at the moment. By and large, mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, the fit was quite uh, quite okay given this. Uh, uh, more versatile model, right? That allows for differentiated um, um, uh, slopes for the different farm types. Okay. So with that, I thank you, uh, Martin. I think we're running out of time. So I thank our discussion, Peter. So I thank our viewers for joining us today and taking their time to listen uh, to this very interesting presentation. So once again, I would like to thank our organizers from IAMO, Nadir Janibek, and IFPRI, Kamran Kramov, for helping us organizing these uh, virtual seminars. Please join us next Wednesday for a very interesting presentation from uh, Professor Richard Pomfret, based at the University of Adelaide, Australia, uh, with his topic on Uzbekistan and uh, the World Trade Organization. So that should be very interesting. So once again, thank you very much. Martin, I'll send you the rest of the questions by email. I promise that to our viewers. And then, uh, so if you, should you have any more comments or questions, please feel free to uh, be in touch with us by email. So thanks once again and stay safe. Bye-bye.